I think one of the uh, laudable uh, steps that were taken by the government of India post-1986 policy was to establish district level institutes for elementary teacher training. These were called diets, the district institutes of education and training. Um, these were established, meant to be established one for each district. It took a long time to do that, but this laudable structure was unfortunately left to languish because when the DPEP program came into existence, they started their own structures like a straight state level project office, like, you know, whatever. They tried to create their own structures within which DPEP would run. The idea was that we should have utilized the newly developed structures so that their capacities would be developed. And then the country would have a system in place after the World Bank loan is over. But that didn't happen, unfortunately. Now the diet's uh, envisioning was a bit ambitious, I would say, because they envisioned them to have seven departments. Uh, apart from teacher training is one, pre-service, then they had in-service. They had some kind of a lab area where they had to do research. Then there was some adult and continuing education. I think that was a bit too ambitious because they were never able to put together the number of faculty that was stipulated. Let's say about 23, 24 faculty, but every diet would not have more than seven, eight, nine at the most, which left diets really starved of funds and resources. And therefore, they could not do their work really as well as they had been planned to. And I think that led to um, a lot of, uh, in, a, in a sense, wastage of resource and as a result, a sort of uh, under-preparation of the institutions that were created. With the result also that because there was no elementary education cadre that was being developed in the country, all the secondary level educators were brought into diets. So they were not really trained to teach at the elementary level. That was another issue. And when we started the BL Ed, this was a very interesting discussion we had at NEPA, I remember, where Professor Jalaluddin was also there and we had Professor Govinda and Professor Verghese. And they all felt that there is a good way forward if we look at our BL Ed graduates as coming out and coming into diet also as faculty after post-graduation. That was a line of thinking that we had, but that never happened. Also because the diets were left at the plan level. They never became part of the system. They were still at, from the seventh plan they started, they continued to be at the plan level up to plan 12, after which five-year plans were dismantled anyway by the current government because then they brought in Niti Aayog. And Niti Aayog's push was to merge schools, to actually merge schools, to rationalize schools because remote habitations have very few children, we should not be wasting resources, let's merge them together, but which also meant that the 1986 policy of one kilometer distance for a school was completely violated because remote habitations like Adivasi habitations, children had no choice but to be pulled out of school because the schools had merged, they had just closed down. So Niti Aayog actually did a lot of damage in that sense by in the name of rationalization, they actually did not really care for uh, you know, sustaining education for all our children, wherever they came from. And the diets were not given any additional funds. So as a result, even in the capital of the country, Delhi, the diet faculty is starved of resources. So let's say there would be no more than eight or nine faculty in one diet. So they are left with very little resource and yet they are expected to teach a large number of teachers and continue. Now of course everything is changing. I think the in-service training is also now more or less not happening or if it is happening like in Haryana, it is being outsourced to all kinds of corporate groups like the Boston Consulting Agency or something like that. So many manchilashes are coming. Yeah. Actually, education has completely gone out of the educator's domain. It's been taken over by the corporate sector, totally.
and that is very disheartening also because they don't have the expertise so um, the there's a dilution of education that's happening overall including teacher preparation the national council for teacher education uh, became an act of the parliament only in 1995 now that worked in our favor when we started the bled in 1994 because we didn't come under nct they were able to take our norms and not really challenge them so we were you know we had a nice uh, time before the nct became a statutory body the universities really monitored a B.Ed. program which they offered. Every university would monitor at their own level and therefore they kept those standards at some level. But the moment the NCT became an act of parliament and became statutory, a regular, regulatory body, that led to a kind of an imposition of the NCT norms on the universities and which means that undermined the university's academic autonomy to develop curriculum to monitor that curriculum and to be able to evaluate and assess at their own level. The NCT started, for example, the act of the NCT says clearly, once an institution is given recognition by the NCT, the university shall grant approval. Now that itself means the university can't. Now we do it completely the other way in Delhi University. So we first send our inspection team from the Department of Education to a particular college where we want to start the BLED. We inspect that college for its academic re readiness, for its faculty, its resources, library, every, everything else. And once we give that report and say, okay, you're ready for it, then we apply. Then the college applies to NCT to get recognition. This is not something the NCT liked at all. But we were able to do it given the stature of the University of Delhi. It's 100 years old now and it's got, uh, you know, enough repute. But the problem is that almost all universities in the country became subjugated to the NCT. And this is the reason why even the standards of the B.Ed. fell. But I must also add here that the one year B.Ed. did not change its curriculum for a hundred years. That is another reason why the standards fell. The universities also didn't really act proactively in a sense to be able to bring changes that were required. For example, a course on gender. We were able to bring it in BLED program as a core engagement, the theory aspect of it and understanding it in our context. I tried very hard to bring it into the one year BLED in my department, but I wasn't successful. It was an optional course which only 20 students took out of 300. But it became a core course only after the Justice Verma Commission of Gender, if you remember, after the teacher education when the Nirbhaya case happened. That is when it got mandated to be a core course for all over the country. And now we are supposed to have a gender course. So the NCT's relationship with the university has been one of tension extreme tension because there is it's like when we have to appoint faculty in a university for a teacher ed program we are told you have to follow nct norms but then there are university norms how do you reconcile this has been a bone of contention for a long time and the bl ed uh, as a community we have tried very hard to try and sort of bring some rationality to how we need to preserve the autonomy of the university in areas of curriculum faculty recruitment and yet sort of adhere to some of the NCT norms because it's a regulatory uh, body but this is something that becomes difficult to reconcile because as we know all governments prefer to, to have their, uh, you know, ideologies and standards adhered to and give as little autonomy as possible to the university. This is also a reflection of changing times with greater neoliberal ideas being entrenched. There is less and less autonomy for academia and this now gets sealed with the NEP 2020 because the NEP 2020 is all about governance. It's actually a governance model. And they've got a national level body for curriculum, 
for pedagogic, for assessment, even at the higher education level. They are promoting a common curriculum for the whole country. So actually there is a very major step that is being taken to homogenize curriculum and pedagogy both at the school and the higher education level. And that I think goes against the very federal structure of our country because constitutionally states have a very large role to play in education. It's a concurrent subject now but even then states and how do states preserve their language, their, their culture, they can do it through education but if it becomes centralized and homogenized then that is under threat. Yeah, from the perspective of uh, those who would choose to come into a teacher ed program, um, it's interesting to see that over the past 30 years, the BL ed program has actually attracted quite a large number of stu uh, students. So for example, we've had a ratio of selection of 1 is to 9 or even more. So 18,000, 20,000 applicants for 300 seats, 400 seats. Uh, when the B.Ed. became from one year to two year in 2015 on the recommendation of Justice Verma, what we found was that there was a lot of apprehension that we will not get any students, the people will not come, one year is just about enough to develop a career, why will they spend so many years in an institute? But I think slowly these fears, uh, you know, were quite unreal because we find a diverse set of people come into a two-year and those who are far more committed to education. That's very interesting. Of course, we need to do some hardcore research in terms of numbers, but that's the experience we have. That many more serious, you know, and committed people are coming into the two-year because they feel there is a trajectory ahead in terms of a career. Uh, in terms of both finance and in terms of, I think, academic um, uh, trajectory leading to employment, this is a bit of a challenge because if you spend three years in graduation, two years in the B.Ed. and then an M.A. and then you come into employment, it is a good seven to eight years before you find employment. Now B.L. Ed. has a little bit of advantage because straight after school you come in, so you truncate that period from five to four and then you reduce it by a year. Yet this is, because today's times are such that young people want to get into employment and there is a need to start earning. So it's a challenge. But to my mind, if you ask me as an educator, I would say that we need to invest more if we want to educate because you do need to study much more unless you know, you, you're not in a position to really um, uh, train young minds uh, into becoming uh, specialists in history or chemistry or whatever that may be. Uh, but financially it's a challenge certainly because the four-year program does mean a greater investment and with the kind of fee structures that are changing given the uh, market orientation of education. It is um, a challenge for those who don't have enough funds to sustain themselves in a program. And that is the reason why we have been trying to, and through Justice Verma Commission also, uh, stress on the fact that we need to give subsidy to people who are not able to fund their education which is professional because the professional education has many more demands. Uh, now this is, this is really for government policy to see. We are already seeing with the general education becoming a four-year program, they have recently done that, many of uh, our people are not able to come into higher education because the fee structures are very high. So the NEP 2020 actually is creating a segregated education system, one for the privileged and one for the underprivileged. And I think the numbers are hugely different. The privileged won't be more than 20% or even less. And for the bulk of our people, because we are making even teacher education a private kind of enterprise, 
it's becoming more and more inaccessible because of lack of resources. And that also means there are communities in which teachers are not being developed. So those communities are going to be taught by people from other communities. Now this is typically what would happen in terms of language, in terms of SCST, in terms of OBC or even the minority communities. And for this reason, I think there's also a dissonance that happens between those who teach and the you know, student teachers who are being prepared. There was an attempt to do this during UPA government is to create bites, block level elementary teacher education institutes like diets. And that was a very good idea, but I don't think it fructified because there wasn't any resource that was invested in those. Continue to be mainstream kind of in most mm. institutions. Now there are five, I think. Yeah, five. Guwahati is not really offering a BA, B. Ed or BSc, B. Ed, but it's an RIE. Yeah. Shall we mm. see if how they can help mm. in this uh, mm. in the teacher education? Actually, the RIEs are. Uh, very, it's a very economically unviable model. Mm -hmm. That is the problem with the RI, because it has a huge campus. Yes, yes. It has, uh, it's also mandated to have full three years of general education that is affiliated with the university, uh, and it has only one year of uh, professional education. So, in that sense, it'll need to adapt. I think the four-year model is a good model. Uh, there's nothing against a four-year model. We've seen that how BLED is so successful. So RIs will need to adapt to sort of make professional education of great weight so that there is more training there rather than just do three years of a BA or a BSc. But it will also ad have to adapt by not demanding an exclusive institute within this happen. I think the undergraduate model, at least the BLL experience tells us, is an economically viable and an academically, pedagogically sound model because it does give the young students a lot more to do. They become part of college festivals, they become part of debating societies, other kind of activities and that brings a lot of richness to becoming a teacher because a teacher cannot be seen only as a methods master which is what the colonial frame is. So in that sense I think we need to go there I mean however having said that I would still say that I, I would um, recommend that the two year beard post graduation also continues as a model because we do need robust subject knowledge to teach at classes 9, 10, 11, 12. We cannot um, shy away from the fact that we need in-depth subject knowledge. When we make a four-year program the only model for the country, that means the subject knowledge will be only at the plus two level and some courses within the four-year structure, which will not really do justice to an in-depth disciplinary engagement. So I think a, a country like ours which is so diverse, it's important to try out different models and to do some research and monitoring and see which models are working where and how. I think that should be part of our future strategy. But NEP 2020 is again looking at a singular model because their whole um, approach is to homogenize, standardize, centralize and that is where the challenge is. that brings in teacher, the idea of being a teacher into the market, like, you know, oh, yes. so isolated in, in mm. the RIEs or the diets or teacher education colleges. Yes, that is true. I mean, the fact that teacher education has operated in standalone institutions, it has actually intellectually isolated the teacher. And this is one of the key, I think, uh, uh, challenges that we were able to address through the BLED. So the teacher prepared through the BLED is a more holistic teacher who understands the system and is engaged with the system rather than being sort of trained in a cocoon that is in an exclusive standalone institution. This the NCT norm is responsible for. 
because they put these norms in place that you should have an exclusive building, exclusive library, exclusive canteen, exclusive everything. And which also means that you build a wall around you. That is one of the norms of the NCT. And I think it's, it's really, it has physically isolated young people who are preparing to be teachers and it has academically isolated them. So even, let's say, debates in society on gender or caste or other social issues, the communal issues, today we are facing so much of that, all of this, you know, gets completely left out of the teacher education space and there is no intellectual engagement. And if we recall that many of the faculty of teacher education institutions, they may come from different disciplines because we need a science teacher, we need a history teacher, we need a philosophy, a sociology, but they're all one, one each, right? So they never are in touch with their own parent discipline. Now, when they are not in touch with the frontiers of knowledge in their own discipline, then they don't grow academically. And therefore, teacher education suffers not only because of the intellectual isolation of the student teacher, but of the teacher educator herself. So they are totally intellectually isolated and as a result, they go on sort of, uh, you know, teaching the same old um, uh, frames of thinking that they have been trained in and there's nothing new that comes their way because they have no way to actually exchange professionally or academically. The community becomes, shall I even call it, inbred and incestuous because they're just not getting any fresh ideas from anywhere else. And this is what the BL Ed was able to break. But I think ITEP is going to take us back there. There's been some um, researches that have been done, um, interviews, narrative collection from student teachers who've graduated from the BL Ed, who are already uh, still studying in the BL Ed, and classroom observations, um, engagement with them on various issues of diversity, social justice, um, and with teacher educators. So there are some very robust testimonies uh, that have emerged from uh, many of these alumni who speak of how the BL Ed actually has changed their lives. Specifically, they talk of courses like gender and schooling, they talk of self-development workshops, they talk of contemporary India. So they speak of how they were given the opportunity to express themselves and to evolve as people. So they feel the program has given them a lot professionally as well as personally. And I think that is very gratifying to know that there are young people who have really grown and it seems that it's not only that they will become good teachers hopefully, but they also feel that they have become more whole persons, people who become more confident. Many of them speak like this about how they never felt they could speak publicly or that they could question, but that they were able to, um, they were given a, a learning environment where they could democratically even challenge ideas of their teachers. And these are testimonies that are available actually, researchers have been done. Even teacher educators who come from very um, entrenched systems like a one-year B.Ed, even they feel and they have uh, spoken about this, that the program, the BL Ed program and the way it is positioned, the courses are positioned, the way they are designed and the, the dynamism that it brings, it is able to challenge them and uh, they use all kinds of different methods of teaching. For example, uh, many of them use films as a tool for pedagogy and they use them in a manner that allows students to bring their own knowledges, to bring their own personal lived experiences into the classroom and that enriches the curriculum. So I think uh, what is gratifying about the BL Ed is that even after 30 years there are some very robust uh, 
aspects of the program, the design, the positioning of courses, the subject content and because teachers keep upgrading readings, they, it's not as if they're teaching content which is 30 years ago, they keep upgrading those readings and as a result, uh, even now you find student teachers uh, feel very satisfied with what they're going through in the BLED and how it has changed, it is changing them as people and as professionals. The BLED was envisioned to have a career path within education. Uh, even though the system uh, requires you to move up the ladder from primary level teaching to secondary to senior secondary and that system hasn't changed. Uh, we wanted a system where we would give them occupational mobility within the primary, within the upper primary. This is something that we are still negotiating with governments but it's not an easy task. Nevertheless, because they, um, because the BLED graduates are able to get a, a very holistic understanding of not only education as a space, education theory and pedagogy, but they also study the socio-political economic context and a much wider understanding where education is located, they are able to actually go into so many diverse fields. So firstly, they can do a master's in many different subjects. We have graduates who have done master's in linguistics, psychology, sociology, political science, history, uh, languages, and many have gone into law, some have gone into management, some have actually gone into publishing, some have gone into NGOs or even organizations like the UNICEF. There is a range of different spaces that they are finding for themselves to actually utilize the knowledge that they have gained and the understanding they have gained. So the diverse career paths is a real possibility amongst the BLED alumni. And wherever they seem to go, I remember there was one student who actually also went into an IAS examinations and she passed through it. So it would be interesting to follow up to see that. Many have gone outside the country to do their PhDs and many of them are doing very well outside as well.